Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 583. That is 583 of the Agostino Zynga show, kindly titled, Never Dead, Always Alive. Never Dead, Always Alive. I hope you're good wherever this may find you. Hope you're doing fine and dandy. Hope you're in far better spirits and um, physical health than I am, but I'm on the mend much more will be explained later but i hope you are well wherever you may be sorry for the radio silence but i'm back now daddy is back if it's your first time checking out my show and you like what you hear towards the end of the show why not leave a review and if you want to support the show you know what to do click the links support it via the youtube smash the like subscribe share it all that good stuff support the patreon that's all well and welcome you know the ways to do this stuff but i'm back i'm in the hot seat i'm really ready and raring to go really so thank you so much for those of you who have been patient and not been you know beating down the door and telling me to hurry up and get my little mm -mm 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 ass in order but here i am here i am so as most of you would have known by now or some of you might have known by now i had a brief little health scare the last week or so which is why i haven't uploaded or updated or uploaded or shared a, a podcast episode in a very very long time i think the last time i did one was on the 10th of this month and it's now the 18th so for me that's a very long time eight days of non fresh content generation sharing is something that i try not to do and the fact that it happened means that there was a big big issue and if you're wondering what's the big issue at casino what's happened to you man did you get spiked at the Bergheim? did you get ghp did you get roofied did a nice, handsome Italian man try to take advantage of you in the dark room? No, none. None of that happened. Well, it might have happened, but you know, you know what I mean. None of that happened, right? <laughs> Instead, I end up being one of the lucky, unluckiest people in the world. End up contracting some form of um, tonsillitis called um, Jinzi or Jinzi or Junzi or something along that kind of lines, right? Kind of, you know, similar to Juju, whatever it may be some rare form of flipping tonsillitis that basically affected one of my tonsils at the back inflamed to the point where it had to be um all the pus inside of it had to be excreted from a needle then that didn't work then they had to slit it open with a flipping you know blade and that was incredibly painful and now i'm on a crazy dose of flipping antibiotics and you know all sorts of other drugs in order to get me back on the mend i'm in a far better space now the last couple of weeks or so i was unable to swallow so you know having the medicine and taking ibuprofen and penicillin and antibiotics and whatever else i had to take was very difficult to do and it wouldn't lead me to the point of tears but now i can at least swallow which is great but i can't open my mouth too wide so if you're hearing my mouth and you're hearing my overall speech a little bit muddy a little bit marbled you know kind of akin to like a brendan shaw but like i've got marbles in my mouth or like i'm eating a you know or like i'm constantly eating whilst i'm talking i'm not i promise i know i usually sound a bit mad anyway but this is definitely because of my tonsil so that's been a bit of an issue hopefully in the future this doesn't happen again um because the pain has been you know crazy i wouldn't wish on my worst enemy but it has been an eye-opening experience because i've essentially i've been without my voice which i feel like is one of my um strongest tools <laughs> in my arsenal i'm not very good at mental arithmetic um i probably have undiagnosed adhd so my attention span is the greatest so i think my best tool that i have is maybe my height and my speed considering how big i am i'm quite fast i think that's a pretty good asset i don't look fast but i am and then of course my ability to speak because i can get me in trouble out of trouble in a job out of a job you know what i mean it's a good thing so the fact i didn't have it for the last what week and a half or something has been pretty brutal i'm not going to lie so it has given me a somewhat level of appreciation for my ability to speak and stuff it's also made me be a way more conscious of how i treat of how i look after myself overall um i don't think i did anything stupid when i went to berlin i'm pretty sure i didn't i stayed in a pretty decent airbnb i showered every single day if not twice a day because it was so warm over there and i was going out obviously to these crazy parties so the last thing i could do was to go home and shower and of course i'm not at that age where like i'm staying up for three days in a row i at least go home shower sleep and then come back out again or have a bite to eat or something i took i took outfits for the day i washed my hands everywhere i went um i wore a mask on the public transport you know i did all the things i meant to be meant to have done but 
I guess maybe I was just unlucky in general. I'm not really too sure. But in general, you know, going to a place like Bergen or going to any sort of major nightclub or major metropolitan city, it's pretty impossible to kind of um, protect yourself from all levels of bacteria floating around in the air. It's just impossible to do so. I did my best and obviously that didn't work. Um, maybe it happened after I came back. I don't really know. I'm not really sure how it happened or how it occurred, but I'm glad I've got some idea of what it was because one of the worst things about being ill is when you don't know what it is. And also when you're ill, I feel like I've said it plenty of times, I would much rather take an open wound, a broken arm or something um, over an internal organ thing that you can't actually see. It just hurts way more because you don't know where the pain's coming from. Because before when I was in pain um, from this tonsillitis thing that I have, it's basically a form of tonsillitis, I was getting pains in my kidneys as well. That was really strange. I was getting really sharp pains in my kidneys. I was thinking, oh my God, no way do I have kidney stones too. Um, I was getting delirious. I was being dizzy. I couldn't sleep on my on, on a certain side. Um, I could have swallowed my own saliva, so I had to spit it all in a cup. I know it's disgusting to say, but do you know I mean like my throat was that kind of closed and stuff? It was just awful, 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 awful. Um, and yeah, those things you don't really know what what's happening to you, right? And it's really weird to kind of get around it, but you know, luckily we've got the NHS here in the UK, free healthcare, which is great. But the other side of it, which is awful, is that essentially it's the service is just diabolical. You get to see somebody, obviously, you get some sort of resolution, you get medication, obviously, that I have to pay for, don't get me wrong. But still, um, the, you know, the looking after the thing, the transport between the hospitals, all that sort of good stuff, the, you know, being looked after by a whole bevy of like highly, highly, you know, proficient nurses and doctors and surgeons is great. But the overall care in between is just a disaster class. And I have real sympathy for people that work there, like, because the emergency room that I was in was just, it was like a war zone, man. Legitimately like a war zone. There was kids that run into door frames, guys who had clearly been on the piss all night, a person who reacted really terribly to some sunscreen on their feet, and their feet looked like literally elephant man, like an elephant's foot, sorry, in terms of swelling up. And it was a really petite, like, you know, Mediterranean type looking girl. And her feet were super inflamed, covered in boils all over the place. I don't know what happened there. Um, a lady who kept reacting really poorly to whatever painkiller or whatever they were giving her in the drip. She started shaking and convulsing. That was pretty scary to watch in real time. It's a really, um, it's a really kind of sad place to be. It legitimately is. And these doctors and nurses have always got somewhat of a cheery disposition on. And I, I know some of it must be they're kind of dead behind the eyes. They have to kind of just like, you know, power through. But their ability to just keep going and going and going and answering the same old questions. There's this other w weird older dude who I don't know what was wrong with him, but he just kept ranting and raving about wanting a sandwich for like an hour. Like, I want a sandwich, cheese sandwich. What's that one? And they kept repeating the same thing to him. We've ordered a few, it's coming. We've ordered a few, it's coming. He just wouldn't wait and then said, I want a drink. So we've got water over there. He's like, I don't like water. I want something else. So, which clearly, you know, he was, he wanted them to, he wanted them to, them to pour him out a pint or something. But it was just a bizarre place to be. It really, really was a strange place to be. I'm not going to lie. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, I understand why people don't like going to hospitals. I really do get it because it's fucking crazy. But I am thankful that we have the NHS. I am thankful that I'm able to see somebody fairly sharpish in terms of getting um, treatment and whatnot. Um, and yeah, I was able to get, I was able to be in and out of there within like what a couple of days. I had to stay over the night because obviously um, I had some form of surgery done. It wasn't really because I wasn't under anesthesia or anything. They sprayed the back of my tonsils with numbing spray and then slay it opened. The syringe was gnarly though. The syringe was gnarly. Placing a syringe in my tonsils and then trying to extract whatever pus was in there out was gnarly because it didn't work. He did it twice. <laughs> it didn't work, right? <laughs> and it was brutal because I could feel it po poking in there and like trying to, oh, disgusting. And I could see a little bit of it in the needle, but it wasn't enough because I guess it was just forming. And then the second surgeon came and he was like, oh, I suggest if you want to go home sooner, and you want to recover quicker that I should just slit it and he just did like a I think he did like a cross mark I think if I'm not mistaken to kind of get the pass out but the thing was that was really weird and that I didn't really understand there was no extraction I remember when I got my um no no nasal polyps taken out right I had these things because of my fever and whatever it may be my perspir my my respiration was affected that way from a long time ago I remember when I got that done they had this sort of suction thing they'd use this little what this little plastic tube that they would kind of suck out all the skunk whatever 
they did none of that so I had to basically just cough it all out it was just ugh, honestly it was gnarly man it was fucking gnarly but anyway I'm back now um sounding better than ever I hope <laughs> but yeah big up everyone that's been chilling big up everyone that's been you know, messaging me and sending me some what you call it well wishes I do appreciate you all um I did a bit of a troll because I made it seem like I was something way more serious and I had got you know I, I, I flipping had a drug over this or something but you know it's fun to troll it's fun to lie <laughs> it's fun to exaggerate things a little bit so please let me have some fun and don't be too angry at me I'm okay I'm okay I'm okay Anyway, moving on quickly. So, mad things to talk about. One thing I wanted to speak about quickly to get on top of was the whole debacle that's happening with United at the moment. Um, I think most fans who have, you know, who've been paying attention are pretty frustrated with what's been going on in Man United because we've all we all don't we all don't have amnesia. We all remember that last season was maybe one of the worst seasons we've ever witnessed in modern day supporting of United, right? The post Sirs Ferguson kind of era. Considering everything that kind of went on in the season where we finished the performances, especially towards the end of the season, it was an absolute car crash of a season. And you would imagine that, you know, with those kind of seasons in the rear view, you'd want to kind of put your flag in the ground and try to basically prove that you're trying to do things differently. You recognize your mistakes. It was a big error. Did, 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 did. Here's what we're doing differently. And there's been no real change, we felt like, as fans. Um, apart from the reshuffle of course was happening in the boardroom level and with the managers and stuff we've not really seen anything to indicate that United are a different out outlet or a different outfit sorry we're a different football club that we've kind of recognized the errors of our ways and we're going to try to balance the commercial with the footballing success right we're going to try to make it make sense in that way and it hasn't happened and um, so far, this pursuit we're doing of the moment with Frankie de Jong seems to be one of the things that's really pissing people off because if you let go of a player, like a marquee player, like a Paul Pogba, you would imagine one of the main things you'd want to do is want to kind of flex your muscles as a big club and basically prove that, you know, big players come and go all the time at a club like United and you can go and maybe get somebody in like a Frankie de Jong who's maybe a little bit younger maybe who maybe might fit the club ethos and what we're trying to do a little bit better, has a relationship with the pre with the new coach that we have in at the moment, and just generally is somebody that you can maybe, you know, market as the quote-unquote replacement or the heir apparent to Paul Pogba as he leaves. And that's one thing. But as a United fan who's paying attention, you would also agree that we don't only need one player. It wasn't only Paul Pogba that was the issue at United. We needed a whole bevy of football players, which doesn't include everyone that's leaving. Right? We think we've got loads of players who have actually ended up leaving in the end, right? especially senior players. The Matters, the Lingards, the Pogbas and stuff, um, and the Cavani's and a few other people have left. But we've always needed probably five players. I think Ralph Ragnick, when he was going through his last couple of weeks at the club, he said famously that we needed 10 players out of the club and probably 10 players in. And quite soon after that, he was relieved of his duties, right? So you could see where the club stands at, where those kind of things. The club's not really known, or Man United is not really known for signing more than three first-team players. We have a real aversion to kind of getting that many players in, which is bizarre because the club also has this weird thing where if the player's running and they contract in their last year, they automatically renew it because they view players as like an asset. So it's very strange. Don't want to sign loads of players, but also one don't want to let go of players. Very, very bizarre. But that aside... This Frankie de Jong pursuit is really starting to boil people's piss because what we're seeing now is what we've seen in previous seasons where United are concentrating on the marquee signing, but they're also taking their eye off the prize, which is the general overall squad balance and dynamic. We don't have it at the moment. We still have a pretty imbalanced and I would say ill-equipped defence. The goalkeepers, are they really up to par to have what kind of football uh, Ayrton Hag wants to play? The central mid or midfield, um, even if you sign Frankie de Jong as a replacement for Pogba, you still need to have a replacement or somebody that can sit as a six, a replacement for Matic. We don't have that at the moment. We've lost Matic. We've lost, sorry, we've lost uh, Mata. We've lost Lingard. Who is replacing those players? Are they players from the youth team? We don't really know. Nothing's been communicated either. And then to make matters worse, if that wasn't a clear indication of just how poorly we've run, this story comes out, courtesy of um, Sport Bible. And it says as follows, May Night CEO meets fans in pub and talks on nightmare season. So not only are we run by or are we owned by some of the worst football owners, I would say, in his history of football in the Glazers, right? 
I say the Glazer ownership has to be one of the worst ownerships ever in modern football, especially considering how big of a club we are, especially considering how, I would say, on paper, easy it is to generate money and income and, I would say, somewhat success on the football pitch with the club that you have at your disposal. To fuck it up to this degree, I think, is a gross mismanagement. It's the kind of thing that you should be taken to court for and definitely is, for me, a proof that they are one of the worst owners in the world. So we don't even have... It's not even we have one of some of the worst owners in the world. We also have some of the worst people operating the club in the world. Um, and this Richard Arnold guy seems like he's no better than Ed Woodward. Absolute numpties, the whole lot of them. So for whatever reason... Our new CEO who took over from Ed Woodward, who, you know, Gary Neville famously said he's nothing like Ed Woodward. He's trying to get the football people in place, which to me just sounds like he doesn't want to take any responsibility, would rather kind of pass it off to people, somebody else, because he knows it's been 10 years of failure. So most likely it's not going to be under his tenure that we're suddenly going to be a success again. So why put yourself on a chopping block when you can just get other people to kind of take the brunt of the football decision? So... This guy has now decided a great way to sort of quell the fan fears and to kind of get us back on song is to sit down with random fans in the fucking pub and talk about the inner goings on of the club and what can be done to fix it. And it's just, it's a nonsense. It just beggars belief, all of this stuff. It really does. But anyway, it says as follows. The group of United supporters were, su were supposedly planning to protest outside the 51-year-old's house, which is a great thing. So clearly these protests that everyone keeps telling us don't work um, especially the ones that are incredibly uncomfortable, the ones that you go into the people's homes, the ones where the fans don't turn up to matches and don't buy tickets. Not the ones where they buy tickets and walk out, no. The ones where you don't buy tickets, you don't buy merch. These actually affect the club because somewhere along the line, this protest got back to Richard Arnold and he got nervous and decided to kind of meet the protesters before they came to his house, of course. Makes complete sense. He's probably going to move off this as well, anyway. Um, however, after the news of the plans got to him, Arnold decided to meet the supporters at a local pub and they were, to, um, they were in to talk through their anger and the situation the club is in. United finished the Premier League season with the worst ever points total and their highest ever goals conceded since the, concept, since the competition inception in 992. There's yet to be any signings this summer, while the window has only been open just over a week. The support frustration stems from the business that their rivals are doing. Of course, Harlow went to City. <coughs> Those are the two teams that are very top of Europe right now, but they're still improving. United fans will almost, all, will almost always place the blame on the Glazer family door. The owners of the club had Ed Woodward in charge for the better part of the last decade, and United have continuously wasted money through the poor signings. After purchasing the fans, a beer, after purchasing the fans and the pubs and drinks, Arnold sat down in the beer garden to listen to their views and explain the different areas where the club are trying to improve. One fan recorded part of the interaction. Arnold shared sentiments with the fans, um, with the United's poor operating and transfer window. He says as follows. We spent billions of pounds on players. We spent more than anyone in Europe. I'm not thrilled where we are. It doesn't sit easy with me. But what's, ha what's, but what's happened is what we've we fucking burned through cash. You can't, go, you can't go to our training ground and say, by the way, show me where that billion pound is. Because I don't think we've, we've spent, done it well with the money we've spent historically. I'm not here to defend Joe Glazer or the shareholders. They can speak for themselves. They don't ever speak to themselves. Arnold went on to mention the club needs investors in order to make progression. So this summer, the money the manager and the director has on the football he wants is there. For the future, he said, we are investing in a new stadium and that sort of stuff to do the latest, the greatest 250 million training ground. We've got to do something. We've got to get investors in, which is weird eh, to say they need investors in to improve the stadium. Anyway, continues. Um, he says here... I need that to do what I want for the club. I've got to have more cash than I have now. No club in the world has the money to build a new stadium without getting it from someone. You either borrow it from someone or invest it. With the supporters against the Glazers, Arnold spoke of the situation. He reportedly admitted that he expects he accepts that the protests against them will continue, but says that if the ownership was to change, the parties will need to see the club in good position. However, also adding that the previous campaign was a nightmare for him too. The money has got to come from somewhere. Uh, da, 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 da. So, I think it was an absolute horror show to have the CEO of Man United, a big club like Manchester United, sitting down in a pub talking to fans is diabolical. I'm also interested to see what somebody like a Rio Ferdinand would say because he was somebody that was quite vocal about Eric Ten Hag, sorry, about Ralph Ragnick basically airing out the club's public laundry, right? And he wasn't for that and he felt like the club should put a muzzle on him and he shouldn't be speaking to the public. I wonder what he will say about how Eric Richard Arnold is coming, going to pubs and talking to fans because he's, he's afraid of some protests outside of his home. Absolutely nonsense, man. Um, then there's a bit here about transfer strategy I'll quickly read. 
da, 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 da. Um, he said the fans said that they weren't making him out to be a hero, but the group perspective him came out to speak about things. Da, 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 what do you say? Uh, what do you say about transfer window? He said the money's our consideration. Who we want? It's the manager who wants him. That's what we actually done to work. Looking at great player. Do you want to buy him? Okay, cool. This is a good point he made actually, which was quite interesting. He says money is not a consideration in who we want. It's the manager wants if it's that it's that the manager wants him, that they've actually done the work on looking if he's a great player. Do you want me buying the players? Doesn't that ring a bell? So obviously he's clearly kind of alluding to Ed Woodward. I don't think that's a great thing personally, as a as a professional, as a colleague, because essentially Richard Arnold was still working for the club when Eric, when Ed Woodward was there anyway. So it's not as if like he didn't know of him or his tenure. So the fact that Ed Woodward was able to basically do an inept job really really poorly for the best part of 10 years without having his neck be on a chopping block in a serious way until towards the very very bitter end when it was kind of obvious that he did nothing right for his entire time at the club is diabolical and it also goes to show how terrible the owners glazers are because it seems like they just let they've, they've owned the club they let whoever they trust run it but the people who they let trust run it don't know what they're doing either but they're also kind of impervious to asking for help or to get other people from the outside in to basically assist them. So it's an absolute shit show of a situation. The last part is taking a, a reference to the dam. The, the fan came down, so, uh, yeah, so I don't like it. I think it's really diabolical. I think it's really awful. Um, I think in general, what I would like to see, like I've said plenty of times, I don't think Man United will be successful as a football club unless the Glazers leave, unless we change owners and we get new owners in who actually care about sporting um, success on the pitch as much as they do about commercial success off the pitch. We are never going to be the club that we once were. I don't think you can ever, 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 ever polish a turd. It just doesn't happen. No matter reshuffling, new managers, new structures, ever going to change things. The fact that essentially John Murtaugh's in a job and Ralph Ragnick isn't at the club, tells you everything about the club, really, because Ralph Ragnick's overqualified for the role as a consultant. John Murta is underqualified for the role he has as a director of football for a big club at Man United. Dan Fletcher should be nowhere near that role either, but he's somewhere there too. And the fact that those guys are basically running the club in terms of specking out the overall direction of the football club and where we're trying to go in accordance with the manager says everything you need to know about the football club so the fact that the Glazers allow that to happen tells me that unless the Glazers leave we're never going to be successful it doesn't matter what coach we get the only slight chance we have to be successful again under the Glazers is if we somehow manage to stumble upon Silas Ferguson reincarnate some new manager comes up who happens to be the you know the you know Silas Ferguson regen which I don't think is ever going to happen because, you know, that's a once in a lifetime sort of thing. But if that happens, fair enough. But apart from that, if we want to try to compete with all the other clubs in Europe, the other clubs in the Prem, winning league titles, domestic cups, European trophies, we're not going to do it with the Glazers in charge. We're just not. They're just terrible. They don't know what they're doing. They are horrible owners. They hire horribly. Um, they fire poorly. Like, everything's just bad about them. Everything. There's nothing, nothing good about their ownership at all. Zero probably one of the worst owners I've ever seen in football in my entire life and I can't wait until they're gone moving on we've got this clip courtesy of Glock Topics which really kind of put a little bee in my bonnet it's a random clip it doesn't really bother anybody but for me it just kind of pissed me off because I've been in a situation way too many times and the caption says as follows your barber slash hairstylist kick you out of the chair for a celebrity you upset or understanding question mark and it's a video of what appears to be Quavo from the Migos walking into a local barber shop. And as he's walking in, one of the guys who's, I guess, meant to be cutting him is a main guy there. And he's got somebody else he's cutting and the guy starts laughing because I guess he understands that he has to get out of his seat in order to allow the celebrity to jump on and have his hair cut. Hey, Lance. You gotta go, Lance. You gotta go, Lance. <laughs> honestly i would legitimately legitimately cause world war three and that kind of thing i've never understood this it depends what barbershop you go to in general right but there is a certain thing with some hood barbers where if you're like a local or a regular you might have the advantage of maybe jumping the queue um, based upon the barber because essentially the barber gets to choose who 
they like especially if the barber's the owner they get to choose who they can cut next because usually most hood barbers whoever's the owner happens to be the best barber right in there and that's who everyone wants to cut with anyway so he can decide if he wants you to go next or if he wants you to go fourth because you know you want to get your haircut from him so you kind of acquiesced keep your mouth quiet and keep it moving but for the most part i've always felt like any store you go to any business whatever it may be it's a democratic situation right like the, you go there early you queue up um especially some most hood barbers you don't even you can't even book an appointment you can kind of book like a time frame that you want your hair cut in two to three four to five ten to nine nine to four whatever right you can you got like a time frame you want but it's never like precise okay i want my hair cut at nine you're sitting at nine most time it doesn't happen there are some barbers that exist like that but for the most part you know things can happen throughout the day but the idea that you can be in your seat sitting down getting your hair cut doesn't matter if he's just placed a tissue around your neck or whatever it may be and then because somebody is more famous walks in that they can get you to stand up off your seat is absolutely disgusting it's heinous it really is disgusting and if anything it goes back to this whole idea that some people have that celebrities are like somewhat special or better than you and i when they're not they're just regular people what they've done is that they've been able to execute on a very 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 high level right whatever they're doing whatever their talent is whatever their skill is whatever the occupation is they execute on a very high level execute 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 you know build a fan base whatever it may be cool did their thing but essentially they're just like you and i but they've been able to execute what they're doing on a very high level there's nothing that makes them any much any more better than who me and you are none whatsoever and this idea that they can walk into a barber shop and you know make you jump out of your seat in order for them to get a haircut as if their time is way more valuable than yours is insane who's to say that their time is more valuable than theirs what what makes you um ascertain that an appearance on jimmy kemmel is more important than you getting your haircut before you go to work why does that why does one thing outweigh the other why not just come earlier and again if you're a celebrity and you've got all the money and you've got all the vvs's and stuff why not just hire your own personal guy to come to your house and cut your hair before you leave why do you have to go to a hood shop and basically you know disturb everyone's um procedures and protocols just because you know whatever it may be he might be the best person to cut your hair locally i don't like it i really don't i think it's fucking annoying um and i would be super pissed off because it's, it's one thing if you're sitting down and you know waiting whatever it may be and he walks in that's one thing which was st still annoying me too the fact that because most of the time in his barber shops they don't really communicate with you as to when you can expect to get your hair cut you just have to wait right until somebody calls your name so it's one thing if you're sitting down waiting and you're not in the actual barber's chair and then they say hey and then he walks in and then you know you just kind of clock in your head all right cool maybe because he's a famous guy he gets to go in front of me but it will still leave a sour taste in my mouth i'm like why is he going in front of me because he's famous it makes no sense in no other business in the world will somebody famous just go in front of you because it just fame it just doesn't work or not a business that i would want to be a part of nightclubs work and the things where they you know prioritize people who are famous and stuff i don't like anyway and i never go to them for the most part i feel like everybody should have an opportunity to go if you have the money if you have the time to queue up and wait or whatever it may be and you're well behaved da -da -da -da, you should be able to go anywhere you want especially a best your fucking barber shop like and i'll bet you any money too the, what makes this more infuriating i bet you any money the barber was probably stalling a lot checking his phone it wasn't like he was okay hey guy i'm gonna cut your hair but quavo's coming in it and he's gonna tip big i like the guy whatever it may be right it's not even like oh let me just let me just run through this quickly right and then once he comes i'll cut him and then i'll jump you back on the seat do you know what i mean that kind of vibe like okay let me run it through i bet you was wasting time checking his phone talking to quavo on the way there he's a sister like just being a prick basically right and then the guy turns up and he's flipping already fellatioing him from the door as he walks in and i hate that shit because he's already he's already recording right? he's already got his phone on flipping instagram stories recording as a guy walks into the shop so clearly he was anticipating the guy's arrival that's the thing that i don't like so if you're going to if you're going to kick me out of my seat at least hurry up and get the haircut done because i don't necessarily care about him i'm coming here to get my trim like don't get me wrong sometimes you know barbershops have a good little local community vibe to them but for the most part i'm here to make myself look cute make me look cute as quickly as you can let me leave this establishment and then you can go on and you know 
what you call it, holding hands with your guy and asking about three point throws or whatnot, three point shots, whatever, you know, whatever it may be, you can do that stuff. But I would be greatly offended to the point where I would legitimately start a ruckus. Like, you're not doing that to me. You're not getting me up in my seat to let everybody sit down. Like, nah, not happening. Not happening. I don't believe in this whole ideology of flipping separatists in the first place. They know better than you and I. Um, there's nothing that separates them from you and I apart from they're well known. And that doesn't mean that they get to be treated better than you and I. It's just a, a bunch of absolute bullshit. And this I say more so because I feel like the level of customer service in black barbershops anyway is super low in general. It's horrible. It's terrible, right? Especially when you go to like, you know, your aunties to go get your hair braided and stuff, right? Sometimes, you know, they won't even, you know, smile at you sometimes. It's fucking awful some of the treatment you get in there. But you put up with it because you got nowhere else to go. The last thing I'm going to accept now, of course, you're not going to let me book a time to get my seat in there specifically. You're going to be answering your phone two minutes. You're going to be jumping off to go eat some hot wings. You're going to be, uh, whatever, texting somebody. You're going to be checking with the girls that walk by the store. You're going to be doing all this nonsense stuff so probably just doing your job. All right, I'll suck it up. But then you want me to sit there and then stand up halfway through with my with my with half of my head not done. So Quavo can sit down. Come on, man. Don't piss me off. I would not have it in the slightest, but maybe I'm in the wrong. Maybe I'm absolutely going off the boil here and I'm really exaggerating and making it worse than what it is. But let me know in the comments down below. Would you allow a celebrity to take you out of your seat? Imagine if you were at a restaurant somewhere and you had a good seat. You had like a good bar seat or you had like a good table for two seat near the corner or more next to the fan or something that was nice. And they said, oh, the celebrity's coming in. Would, would you mind standing up and going and sit over across where the boiler is? Or you got a bar seat, would you mind sitting over there at the front or just getting up and moving? Come on, man. No, no, no. You can't be doing that to man. You can't be doing that to man. Maybe I'm in the minority there. Anyway, moving on. I, of course, wanted to mention um, Drake's album that dropped the other day. So, honestly, never mind by Drake. Um, surprise drop. We didn't have any idea it was it was happening or coming unless you were paying attention to the right podcast and stuff i did see a clip of maybe joe budden mentioning that he heard a rumor that beyonce and drake were dropping around the same time so obviously he was proved right but if you unless you were a real music junkie you probably had no idea he was coming um this summer especially on an album maybe at most you might have expected him to drop an ep for the summer or something but i don't think anyone would have expected him to drop an album especially so soon after um certified lover boy but seeing a certified lover boy was the last album in his deal and it did in my opinion feel like a compilation of just lucy's that were hanging around that kind of fitted a certified lover boy theme that he probably didn't want to just bin because it's a pretty sick name for an album especially for someone like a drake it was it was probably wasted a little bit if you think about the title and you think about drake being mixed race and you think about the kind of music that he produces so if i love boy should have been a bit more there should be more to it in terms of looking back at it sonically artistically but whatever we move on you just would have been you just i don't know if you if you're just a casual fan maybe you wouldn't expect this to drop so soon after but i had a feeling or i had i had a feeling especially after donda 2 that they would be maybe an acceptance or maybe even no, 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 let me say yeah let me here's my theory i had a double theory i had a theory after Donda two and the passing of virgil that there would be some sort of a change in how drake basically approached his art because for the longest time i've kind of complained not as other fans have because i think some fans will say drake still doesn't have like a classic album like an album that you could listen to front to back and say boom that's a classic right or that's a real cohesive project the closest thing maybe you could say might be views might be nothing was the same um i think that's probably the two albums that probably stand out people in terms of being like cons co um consistent um solid pieces or bodies of work right so far we haven't really got that from him he seems to be somebody that can do amazing verses amazing tunes amazing you know just in terms of just ga capturing a moment on a track but in terms of actually producing a body of work it seems to always kind of miss him but for the most part one of the things that's kind of bothered me about drake really has been his reluctance to kind of just try shit like you know how kanye does every single album is basically different from the rest similar to like a title the creator for the newer generation kids now like them or not as artists or like the music or not as a fan of music 
as an artist you have to respect them because at least every time they put an album out it's a completely different concept it's a completely different soundscape or it's an evolution from what they've done prior they're trying loads of really crazy and creative ideas about song structures and bridge and hooks and choruses and verses and inflections of the voices like they're trying really interesting things and keep on pushing themselves and i think what that does is that it gives the customers or the listeners space and opportunity to basically um listen to what you have to produce, present to them with open ears so they're not just closed and waiting for exactly what they want to hear and i feel like drake's issue over the years has been because he's been trying to service his fans too much yeah a bit too much fanfare a bit too much sorry fan service he's kind of boxed himself in where people only want to hear him rap or do the r&b stuff they don't want to hear anything else and i feel like maybe this is the best direction he could have gone in by dropping honestly never mind because this is an entire dance basically album for the most part with the exception of one track towards the end with 21 savage this is an entirely an album made of flipping house cuts whether it's deep house atmospheric house tech whatever you want to call it this is what it is and i wanted this from drake from time ago because i would have imagined him doing like um itello y disco -y type Majid Jordan inspired that kind of pop um, e electro, electro dance sort of type music he would smash that out into pieces if he just did an album of that right an album full of those kind of tracks an album full of whatever he's into now in terms of Amar Piano and Flipping House and stuff that would be a really great way to go about doing things and I feel like as much as people don't necessarily like this album what this will end up doing I feel like hopefully we end up resetting people's palette when it comes to Drake so that they don't need to always just wait for him to drop R&B and rap stuff. It can just be whatever he wants to do as an artist because now, if you're Drake at this level, you've got nothing really to prove in that lane. You've already done it. And if you want to try to produce a classic album, I think the best way he's going to be able to do a classic album for me is going to be able to go this way. This route he's going at the moment where he kind of tries to put sonically an album together that kind of pushes himself out of his comfort zone that's where he's going to actually make a classic album i don't think he's going to make a classic album trying to sit there and write a flipping hardcore rap album or with r&b influences i don't think it's going to work that way i think it's going to work making a quote-unquote concept album and from that you'll see the classic arise from it in my personal opinion but i loved it personally um i did what i usually do and i kind of made sure that i didn't watch or listen to anyone's opinion online i slapped it on my app my apple music i've now got these new amazing sony mx was it mx freeze right wireless bluetooth headphones right um what you call it um anti-noise cancellation headphones which are great to listen to some albums and stuff i whacked those on closed my eyes and just listened to it from front to back and absolutely loved it absolutely loved the entire thing and i guess because i'm a dj myself because i'm a fan of dance music because i go to nightclubs because i'm a flipping nightlife aficionado this immediately kind of grabbed my attention and kind of kind of hit a note with me and obviously being a european maybe it kind of resonated with me more so if you're an american fan of drake you probably don't really get it because you don't really probably go to clubs like that or you don't really like house music like that but for someone like myself who hears this music all the time when i'm out and listens to it and plays it out and about and stuff this definitely is something that i um would be into 100 percent and it was funny too because i'm a fan of kind of music too this great little um collective of djs and label and whatnot and you know merch whatever else they do and production there's just like an entire crew of kids doing or guys sorry doing some cool interesting stuff in the sort of um atmospheric dance music or house music scene it was fairly evident as soon as falling back came on track two that it was uh, and me and Rampa that were involved in it you could hear it straight away from when they from when that track played so that was pretty sick to see it's actually produced by black coffee which i like too because there was a lot of cohesion throughout the entire tracks so i've heard some people say it was boring and it kind of sounded a bit one note but i did feel like there was a real thread that tied all the tracks together and of course that comes from having a one person or a team of people who have the same sort of musical influences kind of overseeing the entire thing such as a black coffee and for me personally i just enjoyed the entire honestly i really did the only track that probably st stuck out like a soft one might have been jimmy cooks between 21 savage and um, maybe that was just a way for him to kind of give us a taste of what's to come for the next ep because i think he announced soon after there's going to be another scary hours coming out so that should be happening soon i think or maybe that's going to be for halloween I'm not really too sure 
but I'm a big fan of it. I really did enjoy it. I think this is going to be very popular throughout the summer, especially here in Europe. I think we're going to hear it all over the festivals. I've seen people do memes about it being played at all the gay clubs and stuff, which I think is crazy and funny because for the most part, most of the gay and alternative clubs that they we have here in the UK and London, most of them play really hard, aggressive techno or really campy disco music. It's nothing really in between. You don't really get a lot of um, gay nights when they just play house music. I don't really, I can't really think of many, especially here in London. Most of them are either really hardcore techno or like kink parties and sex parties, or they're just really camp ultra ultra camp you know ymca type style disco type stuff um so that whole thing was really interesting especially when you consider that sound that he's trying to replicate on honestly never mind is mostly kind of aligned with the kind of bro culture here in the uk which is kind of tech housey which i don't really think it's tech housey i've heard a lot of people say it is tech house i don't really feel tech i feel a lot of house i feel a lot of i'm a piano I feel a lot of deep house, atmospheric, like I said, I mentioned beforehand. Um, but I don't really see a lot of tech house vibes in it for the most for the most part. But I could imagine a lot of those tech house producers are going to be clamoring all over themselves to try and get out edits and remix some of the tracks because they're going to sound absolutely phenomenal once they've been edited and whatnot and cut up and chopped and stretched and whatever it may be. But I really did enjoy it. I think it was a very brave decision from him. Um, considering everything he's achieved, considering what people expect, considering what he probably pressure he puts himself. Um, but then on the flip side of it, if you're just going to be a little bit cynical, you could say if you're going to be cynical, does it feel like Drake has never really fully recovered from that whole push a T battle thing? And is this kind of a continued, long drawn out sort of concussion that he's sort of suffering with in terms of his inability to put together a somewhat cohesive project to the point where he's just like you know what fuck rapping i'm just gonna go and jump on his house thing do you know what i mean this is i'm just i need to get i need to, he's kind of doing that thing what people do where you're basically trying to force the motivation you want to put yourself in a situation so it's going to spark something in you so in order for you to kind of react off of because you've got nothing to react off of do you know what i mean maybe that's one of the vibes i'm not really too sure but that aside, I really did enjoy it. Um, I can't wait to see how this evolves. It wishes to see if this becomes like the lightning rod for a lot of people within hip hop to maybe check out some of the people within that whole atmospheric tech house scene that I'm into. You know, labels like Innovision and of course Kind of Music and whatnot. They're doing some interesting stuff. Maybe people will start exploring that kind of thing. That'd be really cool because I do think there's a lot of parallels and overlap between rap hip-hop music and that kind of scene um of course those people love um what you call it the people that love um that kind of house music are already into vocals so it's not like you're going to techno where for the most part people don't really like the vocals too tough and it can sometimes be a bit of a dud in there i feel like if you was ability to maybe have some of those big artists come in on house i think it would be work really really well and also it's a real shame too because i think there's a snippet on there which plays and um, i think no there's a poem or there's a note on there that basically speaks about it being an ode to Virgil Abloh of course the acclaimed designer who unfortunately passed away and um, this would have been an album that he would have loved really really would have loved Virgil would have absolutely loved this album 100% um, it's probably an and it's probably a what you call it a summation of everything that he's been trying to do in terms of merging the high and the low right in terms of bringing people who look like me and you into spaces like Ibiza into these kind of quote unquote white um, business techno type event type places and to make it look more like the out of the outside world for the most part because that's the one place that you can kind of feel like it operates in a bit of a bubble dance music in it it doesn't necessarily reflect the the world that's basically around or interacting with them for the most part you go to some of these big dance music nights and festivals and whatnot and sometimes a crowd is completely different to who's up on stage it doesn't make any sense and doesn't necessarily change the same lineup same people same color races and creeds and maybe you know the whole reason why virgil was trying to always position himself in front and center and be the dj person and try and do everything even if he wasn't maybe the best at it was to be like no my face also needs to be placed on here because i need kids to understand that you can also do this you can also present at this high level on this stage too it doesn't always need to be 
trap rap stuff just playing for your your friends who also wear jordan ones and you know distressed jeans it could also be for these type of people they also get what you're doing i mean there's a link that ties people together it's all part of culture so that might be something that i think would have been a great thing for him to have seen but you know but again as as i've already mentioned previous times i think one of his best parts of his legacy is always the work and i feel like you know now with this album regardless of how it's been received critically i think it's still going to inspire a whole group of people to go out there and start maybe exploring house music and maybe starting to put themselves in different spaces and environments that they probably wouldn't have done before challenge their ears challenge their palettes um challenge their taste whatever it may be and try some new things and who knows what may come out of it so um really is a great way to kind of honor a man's legacy by just being curious exploring things and hopefully um whatever you explore can then go and touch others out there as well but yeah i really enjoyed the album i really liked it um like i said for the most part i don't really care what critics review say about stuff i listen to stuff with my own ears um but again i might be a bit biased because i'm already a part of this scene this community i'm of, I'm, I'm already going to the flipping um innovisions label night or you know lost in a moment in flipping the uk here in a few weeks so that already shows where i'm at in terms of that stuff you know i'm already obsessed with arm and dixon and all these kind of djs so maybe i'm already a bit of a um compromise or bias in that way but i really did enjoy it but if you haven't already checked it out i'm sure most of you know what the album is honestly never mind by drake it's out now on all of your streaming platforms definitely check it out definitely go and check it out what else we to talk about here quickly um it's interesting da, 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 da. It's away. oh it's away it's quickly yeah so as most of you would have known i went to Berkheim what a few weeks ago and most likely even though i made some very boisterous and big claims on my instagram when i came back about not going there again i'm probably gonna end up going back there again in august but hey you know whatever whatever don't d don't don't um, don't all throw tomatoes at me at the same time but that aside, um, I think I mentioned before I left that there was this really strange thing happening in some clubs around Berlin where people were getting spiked in their drinks with some sort of drug that was making them essentially forget large periods of the night out they were out on. And then there was another part, there was another few accounts of people who specifically went to Berghain and said that they felt pricks against their skin, like someone was put, shoved a needle in them. And then soon after they'd kind of, you know, blacked out and they were woken up, you know, outside of the club or in the club, whatever it may be. So very, very distressing and kind of scary situations. And having been there myself and having experienced something close to what these people have described, it is pretty distressing. I'm not going to lie. Like I had a situation where I was in Berghain and I was um, in the XXXX room, one of the best rooms in there. I think one I hadn't discovered it beforehand. And I think um, something Bozy was playing and I was sitting in one of the black little booth things, whatever it may be. And this random person was kind of, you know, obviously super intoxicated or high, whatever it may be, was starting to lie all over me and, you know, you know flailing around and stuff. And, I guess at the time it looked like we were maybe hooking up at something when our security guards come along and got really angry and basically thought i was had did something to the person which i hadn't done of course and i had to explain myself no i wasn't i was just sitting here this person laid on top of me and then we got to the bottom of it and in the end the guy was like yeah i'm just gonna take her outside to the hospital the ambulance and they can get her sorted out over there so essentially what they were doing from the time that i was in there anyway was that if they see anybody which was good, the one thing i had to say to them which was a good thing i did notice a a, an increase in people mostly plain clothes around the club who were just making sure everyone was okay because of course it was a sylvester um club night which was obviously the new year's eve thing people were going crazy because it was a public holiday so they were making sure everyone was basically behaving and not going too crazy and that was good so maybe everyone kind of feel a little bit at ease but from what i saw they were basically just taking people out who they thought were just too fucked up. They weren't even taking any chances. There was no real sit down or consultation or aftercare. It was just mostly just get out. You get dealt with the hospital or the ambulance around the corner and you go from there. And I, luckily the girl that was who's kind of all over me had her bag next to me and I was able to kind of give it to the person to obviously take for them. But if that wasn't the case, what would have happened? She would have just got chucked out of the club, got sent to an ambulance with no bag, no means to contact anybody or anything. Do you know what I mean? And still in that kind of drunken stupor or like whatever high stupor it must have been. So it clearly is a really distressing 
time to be in a club especially with this stuff hanging over people's heads and i don't really know what the best way to go about it is i'm just a regular punter i'm just a random person who likes to go to clubs and pay money and i queue up i don't know anybody i don't you know i mean i'm just a regular dude so i have no idea what the best way to deal with this source thing is but i can imagine from the club side of thing also you don't want to be liable for people basically being taken advantage of in that way in your club because it obviously sends out the wrong message and makes you look terrible you just don't want people to know that that's happening in there either because it's going to make people maybe afraid to go in there and in the post-pandemic world they need all the partners they can in order to kind of make sure these places are afloat and able to pay their wages and stay around or whatever it may be um and obviously for the partners going there it's really really scary because for the most part when you go to these places in berlin you know the whole idea behind it is that you want to go in and just basically let loose right you want to just forget all your fears forget all your anxieties your trepidations your day-to-day -day life and just kind of let go and just enjoy and the fact that you have to go there and treat it like you are going to like a major metropolitan normie nightclub somewhere is really bizarre you have to kind of cover your finger with tissue i mean it's just it's just weird it just takes you out of the element completely but anyway ra put together a pretty cool article detailing um two accounts from two women about their experience being spiked at Bergen and Sissy Foss which I thought was really enlightening in terms of how it feels and what goes in what goes in and around it and whatever it may be I thought I'd kind of read for you guys here on the pod so it starts as follows on May 27th DJ and producer Zainas spoke publicly about her ordeal via Instagram saying that she had a brush with death of a needle spiking in St. Bergheim um, she told RA that more than 30 people have contacted her since the post with similar stories. Among them were 10 cases of drink spiking and 7 of needle spiking, two of which allegedly occurred at Bergheim. Crazy. So it's basically happening everywhere. It's not just Bergheim, it's happening all across Berlin. Mad. Face Fatal was playing and closing set when I suddenly collapsed, but I had no recollection of what anything was happening from 20 minutes prior to this, she said. Her friends helped her piece it together. The sequence of events they told her was that she was carried backstage, taken downstairs in a lift onto a sofa in the cloakroom area until she became responsive again. As soon as I started to come around, we were escorted to the, out of the club. I realized I hadn't, hadn't had my house keys because my sister had the coat check token for my bag. The bouncers wouldn't let my friend back in to find her. So she finally received my call and came straight out. During this time, Zayna said her friend was freaking out because she was convinced that she he had watched him me die while trying to argue with bouncers to let us stay. Jesus Christ. Ari Augsburg and about the bouncers ejecting Zayna from the club, but received no reply. Ari mentioned the situation to Berlin Club Commission. <laughs> Uh, people getting spiked and maybe potentially dying on a dance floor no reply explanation for why i didn't get in no reply <laughs> not tonight no reply <laughs> sorry at least they're consistent with it. at least they're consistent at least they're consistent um when i already mentioned the situation to the berlin club commission lutz leech leech how do you say that leech sen leech sen ring he said Berkheim was aware that the situation had been hadn't been dealt with in the best way so they're talking through intermediaries madness Zayna said that she was so freaked out by the bouncers that had done something wrong and that she was afraid to go to the police as well that she'd be accused of the bouncers so the the Berkheim law is at such a high level that women are getting spiked in clubs they're forgetting large parts of the night some of their friends are maybe witnessing or think they're witnessing them dying they're waking up after the fact and they're so afraid of maybe being banned from the club not being allowed in again in the future prospect that they're un unable or unwilling to go to the police she added i didn't realize we'd been kicked out because i collapsed so i imagine they must have done something very wrong Zainas had her drink with her all night so she couldn't have worked out what happened when she collapsed. I had taken some ketamine but not in any of that would of course what happened. <laughs> I had a couple of bumps of cake, a couple of bumps of coke in a 2CB but nothing that would knock me out. Um, she said that it was only when Bergheim called her the following day and told her to look for a needle mark that she realised that he had happened. They said that they'd heard of cases like this so I should check my body for marks. A photograph of the jab mark was sent to a doctor friend who said it was probably caused by a needle. Suspect spike incidents like um, scop scopamine can be de de detected up to 24 hours, fentanyl for 72 hours and GHB for 12 but by the time Zayna spoke to Berkai, neither of those substances would have been detectable. If the bouncers must remove partners the way that they removed me, they could at least suggest going to hospital as a test. The suggestion would have made the world difference to me. 
Zaina suspects that she was spiked with scopamine because of the symptoms, including a weird sense of loss of, of my identity. It stays in the hair for three months, so I'm looking for a forensic services that can test this for me. Um, there's been a grand uncertainty about the claims of spiking in the clubs, according to Lish. So after all of this, she still doesn't know what it happened to her, like in terms of like categorically point blank, black and white. God damn it, man. The aftercare in the clubbing scene is just frightening, isn't it? It makes sense anyway, because it's nightlife, right? It is a bit cowboy and from rides on the seat of your pants. But you would imagine with Berlin being like an absolute business, like they run it like a business. I mean, they treat going out like an absolute business to take bounce. They take door picking very seriously, cloak check very seriously, bartending very seriously. It's a business for them. You'd imagine they'd also treat the way they'd make, they'd wanna, you know, people's health and whatever it may be would be a, of paramount importance too in some regard but it doesn't seem like it it seems like as soon as you handle the money and you're in their space you, that that's it you know I mean you're, you're basically every man for themselves that's basically what it is it looks like there's been a great uncertainty about the claims of spiking clubs according to the, that lame again medical experts told berlin cup commission that there's a lack of medical evidence anyone jabbed with a needle would feel it and would, would cause bruises zayn is told ra she didn't feel the needle and didn't bruise so some people are what saying that it's a conspiracy theory about these needles how c so is it possible to feel like a phantom needle getting pushed in you maybe because you've been reading all these stories you go to a club you feel a bit queasy maybe because you had a bad batch of pills and suddenly you're piecing it together making it seem like you got spiked i don't think that's i don't know is that possible maybe but the last thing i'm thinking about when i'm going out is would i get a needle on the side of my leg i mean I don't know. Anyway, it continues. I already spoke with London-based dental surgeon and medical anesthetics, anesthetic specialist, Dr. Avika Lakani. She said it's possible to jab someone in a club without them knowing. Of course it is. A very small 33 to 34 gauge needle will not be fully felt. There is a 0% chance of bruise happening as a result of using a tiny needle to inject somebody anywhere in the arm or the buttocks. Even a needle that you get to draw blood, if someone pricked that on your arm, you would have no idea what was happening. Or even the needle people use when they're doing, um, what's that thing, when you've got low blood sugar sort of stuff. You wouldn't necessarily feel that. You might feel a little prick, don't get me wrong, if someone stapled your leg or something. But a needle was, it was slipping in and out very quickly. Venues in Berlin are caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, strict anti-drug rules in Germany means venues are at risk of being shut down when associated with casualty courses. Ah, this makes a lot of sense then. But he said... The Cup Commission is working in a collaboration with organizations like Sonar, which focuses on safety and nightlife to promote the harm reduction and train staff in venues across the whole city. So what they're basically saying is that even though everybody knows most people that go into nightclubs in Berlin are carrying some amount of drugs on them, people pretend like it's not happening under the guise that because we provide you with this ultra safe space, you're going to be ultra careful and not be a dickhead and not get us in trouble and if you do get us in trouble we're gonna chuck you way away from here so that there's no connection between what you got fucked up on and where it happened because we don't want to get in trouble cool so there is a lot of personal responsibility placed on punters which i think is a good thing personally because i think that's what makes it one of the best club and cities in the world because they don't baby you but when it comes to this level of stuff like people spiking to like do what to sexual assault and r word people like surely you have to step in in it surely you'd imagine um it continues here. a separate incident took place the weekend prior may 14th at city force this time there was a medical evidence confirming a needle was used to spike the victim this is because city force staff called the ambulance crew that verified this lou not her real name was allegedly spiked by a man her friends were able to describe him to bouncers after staff called her an ambulance they said they managed to find him in the venue but didn't find any evidence on him <sighs> imagine that mate being pulled up to you know on the side of a wall by these burly berlin bouncers and being accused of needling somebody i i, I didn't know i, I want to know how people are even sniggle sn sniggling um smuggling needles into flipping venues anyway like fuck you know but lou said evidence was found when paramedics and paramedics and ambulance carried out immediate swab tests and verified she had been attacked with a needle she said the police arrived at the scene and the ambulance and she reported the incident to them she said that she went to the police station alone at a later that date and was told that there was been multiple reports about spiking incidents in berlin she is now in the process of making a report official about the incident she told the ra the last thing she remembers is being back in the left of the club 
um, where there was more room to dance when a man asked her for a lighter then returned to his friends as the group walked past me I felt a slap on my upper right thigh I felt a burning sensation like you feel after a vaccination holy shit after telling a friend they immediately went back to the toilets and found a palm sized swollen red mark that looked like a bee sting on top of the right for a thigh just below the hip bone <gasps> whoa about five minutes later I started to lose my memory my hand started to feel numb my body was shaking I told my friend please don't let me leave it with anyone stay with me and that's the last thing I remember Jesus Christ Lou's friends helped her piece together what happened after that <laughs> because <laughs> Honestly, I'm I'm laughing because this is the only reaction I had to this stuff. But imagine as a woman, what you have to go through in terms of you going out. I told my friends, please don't let me leave with anyone. Stay with me. That was the first thing on the paramount of this person's brain. Like, please don't let anyone convince you that they've hooked up with me and we're fine and we're cool. And no, 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 no. I'm in no fit state to go home with anybody. Please stay with me. God damn it. Lou's friends helped her piece together what happened after that. She said four of them approached security and were taken to the first aid room where they waited for an ambulance. Later, while waiting several hours for a blood test at the hospital, Lou became anxious. Apparently, date rape drugs can't be tested after three hours, so I was afraid they took so long. They checked for alcohol, but I wasn't drinking. They said they couldn't identify anything differently. You know, one of the weird good things about Berlin, I think, where this thing, I think, will end up getting sorted out, is that it's also one of the only places I feel like where there's a high number of people who also go out sober or go out kind of you know california sober like i'm not drinking i'm only doing drugs i'm not i'm not doing drugs i'm only drinking there's a lot of that going around so in other places in the world maybe you could probably get away with spiking people to the point where you're you know essaying them and flipping all wearing them and it will go on forever and ever and no one will probably detect it because everyone's so bent off their faces and stuff and by the time they recollect what happened it's too late in terms of gathering evidence but i feel like because everybody treats clubbing as like uh extracurricular activity and not an excuse to just get absolutely plastered there is a possibility that there's going to be way more people able to kind of piece together what's happened and to be able to be like hey this was a this was a needle this was this this was that and be able to kind of present more evidence so that hopefully the authorities over there can kind of get to the bottom of it because i would hate to imagine what would happen if this happened here in the uk we already saw what happened here in the uk and you remember that story i've got there's a story of this kid where was he in some university town in the uk i don't know where it was don't don't try and ask me where but regardless he had if i'm not mistaken raped up to like 50 plus guys or something in this town that he was in and um most of it was around date rape drugs right he was able to kind of lure them um off the basis of you know hooking up with them off of an app or something and then you know there was large purges of the night where they didn't remember anything and the next day i guess you know whatever happened happened and then of course i think um after a period of time he ended up getting caught because loads of victims came forward and stuff but it happened for a long time. He, he was getting away with it. He was able to kind of, you know, of course, build up so many victims over the years. And you'd imagine a lot of it would have to do because of the lifestyle they were all living, right? Fast, free, drugs, drinking, having fun. So maybe there were so many blurred lines in there where it's hard to kind of recollect what happened. Maybe you feel like, it, you know, maybe did it happen that way? I'm remembering it, did it not? Da, 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 which will kind of lead to delays. But I feel like if there's one place where they will get to the bottom of it quickly because there's so many people out there who would go out in Berlin on just apple juice alone. I feel like it's going to be over there for sure. But it's just mad to read. Anyway, according to information related to Lou via City Force employees, plans are in place to build a task force for safe experience in the venue. A City Force spokesperson told RA that the venue didn't want to provide a response at this time. Whether part of the goals of indulge or respect, um, what more can venues do? Um, the the the, the city of via Zana, she said, if spiking is indeed becoming more common and dangerous, then the laws about casualties at clubs need to change. Strict controls are there to protect people, but they are impending harm reduction that they are not actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, the public health commission has put a call out for people to engage in discussion about spiking. It's taking place on Thursday. Of course, isn't it? If you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna get to the bottom of stuff, the best thing to do is to put together a panel, have people sit down and talk for hours. But yeah, um, keep your head on the swivel anyway. Everyone that's in Berlin, I guess, for the most part, because that sounds fucking bleak. That sounds absolutely bleak. Next, moving on. 
courtesy of RA, we've got some more news here regarding Junction 2 Festival that I was actually meant to go to this year. Luckily, luckily, me and my friend decided to um, sack it off because the lineup kept changing. For me personally, the main thing why I didn't want to go to Junction 2 this year was the location. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, but London festivals for the most part are pretty shit because of our draconian flipping um outdoor noise pollution laws and regulations that we have in place essentially most festivals can't really set up incredible sound systems because you know local councils have a stipulation in terms of what kind of level of volumes allowed in certain places neighbors complain and then that obviously leads to venues not being able to host the, f the festivals anymore they put a lot of money on the line there's a lot of sponsors involved they just can't risk it so either you go to a festival that's really low in terms of the volume and you have to stand really close to the stage or the festivals don't last that long and they hang around for two to three years and they bounce or they get turned into something else what made junction two really special was that it was this festival that was um, essentially in this massive park to the west of London, right, west, 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 on the way to go to kind of Heathrow. But one of the main sort of stages was underneath essentially a motorway. And essentially what they were able to do was get away with a lot of sound pollution and noise and volume increase because it was essentially in the middle of a motorway. And the sound, the acoustics was incredible. Legitimately some of the best acoustics I've ever heard in my entire life. And this is somebody who's been to many, many festivals here in London where the sound's been terrible to the point where I've had to leave early. Or you've had to maybe stand super close to the stage. And, you know, you go to a festival, the whole point of going to a festival, open air, enjoying the sun, having a cider, eating some flipping burgers. It's just to enjoy and frolic and have a good time. You don't need to be right at the front of the stage. So the fact that you have to be there to hear it says everything you need to know about how crap the sound is so when they changed the location i immediately was already out i was like you know what i'm done but i was still kind of holding on because you know festivals are some of the best value for money you can get out there in terms of a night out because you essentially get to see all your favorite people play for a fraction of the price but then the lineup kept changing also because of course the, the, the location changed and the date changed and the people couldn't play a certain date and then I was like you know I'm out and I'm luckily I was able to kind of claim a refund and get money back pretty sharpishly um, but then it seems like now they've completely scrapped it and they're trying to blame it for the transport strikes that are happening and I just think it's because of all the changes they had in terms of location in terms of dates certain DJs they couldn't confirm and then in the end you know they couldn't basically sell enough tickets to make it make sense because the scale of the festival was huge so i'd imagine they would probably you know they had to make sure they do all to break even you have to sell a a huge amount of tickets also and they probably weren't able to do that and from what i've been seeing going out these days post pandemic world and people going to parties and stuff the numbers have drastically decreased since the pandemic even though things have returned to some level of normality the level of people that are out prior to the pandemic to now is just not the same and i don't think we ever will be so i think loads of places are kind of quietly suffering and some of them are able to absorb the cost and i guess junction just weren't able to absorb it it says yeah london festival junction festival has been cancelled for upcoming edition the event original schedule for the 18th and 19th has now been pushed back to next year as four thousand members of the united national rail the maritime plan to strike multiple days this month after a three-year wait, a weekend expected to run at full capacity and a site build about to commence, we are in disbelief at the decision statement concluded. We know this news will be heartbreaking to you as it has been to us, especially after waiting for so long to get together. We look forward to welcoming back to Johnson 2, 27, 28th August to the back of Dock and Fabric later on in 2023. Shit, man. So, yeah, um, terrible for them, I guess. But not surprising really like uh, the clubbing festival landscape has been a bit weird in the uk in general i think post pandemic as great as i said it's been plenty of times i think it's been a really great opportunity for loads of alternative quote-unquote nights to kind of spring out of the blue um out of nowhere sorry and kind of you know um grab people's attention and maybe you know essentially place themselves in the middle of the power vacuum i still think a lot of places in general are just never going to recover because the regular kind of normie punter who would go to these kind of places and fill them out uh, and sell them out have basically moved on to other things they've just maybe grown up they've got kids now they've got other interests whatever it may be um they've just changed as people and it's never going to be the same again and i feel like 
we've slowly but surely got to that point now where people are starting to realize that you know festivals aren't ever going to come back in the way that they were meant to um how we thought they were meant to you know when the when the when the pandemic was finally meant to be over so yeah um hopefully they're able to recover and come back strong again 2023 but you know there is no guarantee of that there is no guarantee of that uh what else we got to talk about here what, what are we talking about Ooh, one hour already bloody hell, i've been rambling forever haven't i um let me move on from that one um what's gonna talk to you about here bear with me a second bear with me a second yeah i think i think that might be it for me you know i think that might be it I don't really, I think, I don't think there was anything else I wanted to quickly touch up on, was there? Uh, no, I think that might be it for now. So as per usual, thank you once again for checking out the Agassino Zinger Show, episode number 583. This has been a bit of a doozer. Um, please excuse me because I'm just recovering from whatever illness I had. Um, hopefully the next one will be a far more entertaining show. Um, hopefully you got something from what I've been speaking about here on this show today. If not, then please come back next time. Hopefully you do. If it's your first time, check out the show and you like what you hear. You know, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Share it and all that good stuff. That would be much appreciated. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace. Bye.